Claire McLean, who is a professor of law at Durham University in the UK and is an expert on laws relating to sexual violence and pornography. Her research has investigated the use of restorative justice in cases of sexual violence, and she's currently working with rape survivors to better understand the ideas of justice and engage them in the reform process. Claire is going to talk about sexual violence and the search for justice. The respondents are Guðrún Jónsdóttir, spokeswoman of Stigamót, and Hildur Fjóla Antonsdóttir, Doctor of Student at Lund University. Very welcome. Good morning, and thank you very much for that generous introduction. Across the world, every day, when we hear yet another report of violence against women, we demand that justice be done. We want victims and survivors to achieve justice. We want perpetrators to be brought to justice. We seek law and policy reforms that will better secure justice. All of us here, therefore, are calling for and demanding justice. But when we're talking about sexual violence, what does justice really mean? We all know intellectually that justice is a highly contested, highly controversial concept. The old white men of philosophy have been debating what justice means for years. Yet I want to suggest that in our public debates, in parliaments, in media, and in our academic work, we often assume that we know what justice means. More specifically, what I want to suggest is that in the particular context of sexual violence, the vision of justice often assumed is a very particular idea of justice. This is justice as synonymous with, as identical to criminal convictions and severe punishments. This is justice as synonymous with the conventional criminal justice system. What I want us to consider is whether this is the only form of justice that survivors are looking for. I want to ask, what does justice from a survivor's perspective look like? And my argument is this. In many countries across the world, at the national level, it's being recognised that decades of progressive law reforms in the field of sexual violence are failing to secure the changes we might like. Prevalence of rape and sexual violence remains high, and victims feel failed by whatever system is in place. We are therefore beginning to search for alternatives, more innovative justice mechanisms, both within and beyond the standard conventional justice system. But this is highly controversial, especially for feminists. This move beyond the conventional standard criminal justice system is challenging. There's much heated debate amongst feminists, for example, about these ways forward. Some are deeply concerned about what they see as a dilution or minimising of a state response to sexual violence. In these controversial debates, I want to suggest that our thinking on what justice might look like for survivors of sexual violence. And in my work and in my experience of working with survivors, their vision of justice is far broader, more nuanced and complex than our traditional assumptions. And I've called this vision of justice kaleidoscopic justice. But before I talk about what kaleidoscopic justice might mean, I want to just say a few words about how I got to this place in my own thinking. I've been considering these issues for a few years, following a study I undertook with my colleague Nicole Westmoreland into the experiences of Lucy, who's an adult survivor of childhood rape and other forms of sexual abuse, who initiated a restorative justice conference. Restorative justice is a term and a process used to describe where the victim and offender come together, often with supporters and facilitators, to consider the impacts of crime and for the offender to make amends. 
Why did Lucy want to hold a restorative justice conference? She said, I just wanted him to hear me. What happened was Lucy went to the police a few years ago to report these offences. The police refused to take the matter much further. They issued a formal warning. Lucy was disgusted, in her words, by this police response and wanted to confront the offender. Her rape crisis counsellor was concerned about her confronting the offender and suggested, therefore, a restorative justice conference. For Lucy, this was going to give her the opportunity to share with the offender the harm he'd caused her, to ask questions about why he'd done it, and for him to hear her. Her experiences of the Restorative Justice Conference are as follows. She talked about how it enabled me to see exactly how it, the harm, had affected me. And he obviously hadn't realised it would have such far-reaching effects on me. The Restorative Justice Conference, she said, was a really big turning point for me, actually. Instead of having this whole episode of my life that I couldn't do anything with, I could stop hating myself and put the blame where it really should be. She said, the conference has made me understand my position as a victim, which has enabled me to resolve a lot of conflict. In retrospect, she said, it was more important to have my say and have him listen than for him to go to prison. So Lucy's experience shows me that there is a role for restorative justice in tackling sexual violence and providing a sense of justice for some survivors. Safeguards are vital. It's only right in certain circumstances, but we must not close our minds to this as a possibility. I believe we must listen to survivors when they tell us this is what they want and that it can work for them. To develop this line of thinking, my colleague Nicole Westmoreland and I undertook a study last summer to begin to explore these issues in more detail with a group of women survivors. We talked to the participants about their ideas of justice, and their vision of justice is considerably different from conventional criminal justice systems. And we've called this vision of justice kaleidoscopic justice. The kaleidoscope, there's a picture here, is a children's toy. It was invented in the 19th century by a Scotsman. And you look down the barrel of a tube, you twist and you turn it, and it produces a huge variety of different shapes and colours and perspectives. Each viewing is different. It's unpredictable at the beginning. Each outcome produces a different pattern. Each kaleidoscope is different. What does this mean in terms of kaleidoscopic justice then? I mean that there's no clear beginning in this vision of justice compared to the conventional criminal justice system which focuses on the incident or the event. It's not as straightforward for our survivors. There's no finite end. Even a conviction does not mean the justice process has been completed. Justice is ongoing, the search is ongoing. Kaleidoscopic justice is not a linear process like the conventional justice system with the event, the police, the trial, the conviction. Kaleidoscopic justice is very varied. It's a continually shifting pattern. Justice constantly refracted through new circumstances, new experiences and understandings. It's a lived, ongoing experience for each survivor and it's lived differently for each survivor over time. There are a number of different elements that we found in our talks with survivors about what constitutes kaleidoscopic justice. And I want to tell you about a few of these different key ideas. The image here as well is supposed to convey the difference from the very linear conventional justice system to the ideas of justice as expressed by survivors. Prevention as justice is a key idea. One participant said, I think the only way you could get justice is for it not to happen, really. That's the only justice that I can see in a broad sense. 
So from the perspective of our survivors, preventing further acts of sexual violence was fundamental to their sense of justice. For survivors, therefore, prevention goes far beyond the conventional criminal justice system. Another woman said, rather than punishing exactly, I'd rather no one go through it. So survivors here are wanting to prevent sexual violence. We all do. But my point here is that for them, this is fundamental and central to their idea of what constitutes justice. Without prevention, they don't feel the same sense of justice. Justice here is societal as well as individual. Social and cultural change as justice. This is linked to prevention and is seeing social and cultural change as axiomatic, as central to their idea of justice. I don't think any type of punishment will be enough for somebody that's gone through it because it can't get the time back. It can't heal the wounds you can't see. So there has to be some kind of education, safety, something put in place because of the society we live in. Apart from education, what else can we do? And this is about education and re-education of criminal justice personnel, perpetrators, society, friends, families, communities. Putting money into education and those sorts of things and rehabilitation is money better spent, quite honestly, than imprisonment, one said. Dignity as justice. We all know that procedural justice is very important for victims. But what we want to emphasise here is that dignity, what's key for them, is more than just procedural justice. This is about how survivors are treated, not just the processes we use in dealing with them. Feeling a sense of justice here entails fair, respectful and dignified treatment by those within the criminal justice system, but also by friends, families and communities. Consequences as justice. When asked about what justice meant to her, one participant said to me very clearly and matter-of-factly, she said consequences and meaningful consequences. This can mean prison for some. The only kind of justice is prison, but for many it goes far beyond this. Exposure. I would have liked him to have been exposed for what he was. Admission. I would never say putting somebody like that into jail would make things right. Like I say, it's admitting. It's them to admit. Restorative justice. I would rather sit down and understand why than send someone away with all these unanswered questions. The consequences sought by each victim survivor varied over time. What is clear, however, is that convictions and prison sentences are not the only consequences that victims are envisaging and seeking in order for them to feel a sense of justice. Recognition as justice. I think it's that recognition of hurt that would mean or does mean justice to me personally. Recognition is a form of acknowledgement conveying support. I recognise what has happened to you. You've been harmed. It's understanding that something is existing and true. And this is recognition by criminal justice personnel, but also friends, families, society at large. Justice for me is having not only the perpetrators, but also different sections of society as a whole understanding that I was really hurt and that and be able to see and appreciate that actually that must have been awful. Finally, justice as voice and support. Survivors wish to name, give voice to the harms they have suffered. Voice, as we know, is also about power and control, power to make and shape your future to ensure decisions are taken with your input. We're all familiar with this desire from victims and it came through our discussions very clearly. What was also clear was the idea of support as being central to justice. 
This is the idea of rebuilding lives, as Susan Herman talks about. And support here can mean counselling help, um, help with employment, education, health needs. It can refer to help going through the criminal justice system. What was clear for our survivors was that without such support, they would not be able to access justice. So justice for them was vital in terms of gaining support. Let me offer some conclusions, therefore. What does this understanding of justice mean? What does kaleidoscopic justice here mean? Justice here from these women survivors is personal and political. Survivors did want to feel justice for their situation, their circumstance, but they also wanted to be part of a society which was just and afforded justice for all victim survivors of sexual violence. Without that broader societal understanding of justice, they felt little justice. What's the implications of this for us? I think this reminds us that we must not divorce questions of social justice from an examination of criminal justice. And that's certainly very important when I think of a UK context. Another conclusion is that justice here is a very lived, ongoing, ever-evolving experience for survivors. Justice for survivors of sexual violence is not here dichotomous. It's not either or. Either you have justice or you don't. It's simply not as straightforward as that. What constitutes justice varies over time for women and for each woman, different elements of the kaleidoscope, different elements of kaleidoscopic justice will mean different things and be more important to them at different times. What's the implications of this for us? Well, it provides us, I think, all with a real challenge. All of us here want to find solutions to the phenomenon of sexual violence. We'd love to find a policy or a law that we think works. We'll introduce it, we'll ensure it's effective, and then we'll have helped to solve the problem of sexual violence. That's what we're all seeking. But it's never going to be that straightforward in terms of securing justice. There is no magic bullet, there is no holy grail. It's actually very difficult, I think, to translate what I'm saying about kaleidoscopic justice into easily implementable policy and legal reforms. Kaleidoscopic justice, to finish then and to emphasise, as a concept, kaleidoscopic justice emphasises the individual as well as the social dimension to justice. It draws attention to our diffuse yet also shared understandings of justice among survivors. Ultimately, kaleidoscopic justice has survivors' sense of justice at its core. And it's their sense of justice that I think should be at the core of our debates. Thank you.